when people look, at, they say, oh, you work in fusion, but fusion's always 30 years away. What do you say to them? I say that we are about to change it. <laughs>
eventually in a, in a larger device and when we actually start producing significant amount of fusion power, the power generated will exceed the power that we, we put in. So a little bit of nuclear physics before we get started. The nucleus of an atom is made up of protons and neutrons, uh, and I've got grapes. So the protons are the red grapes and the neutrons are the green grapes. A hydrogen atom by itself has a nucleus which is just one proton, but there are different forms of hydrogen which are a bit easier to fuse, so that's what's relevant here. So we've got deuterium, which is one proton and one neutron, and we've got tritium, which is one proton and two neutrons. Now, the protons have a positive charge, so each of these nuclei have a positive charge and that means they'll repel each other. But if you put them in a high enough temperature environment so they're going fast enough, you can get them close enough to touch before that repulsion works and then you can get fusion. So if we fuse these two together overall, what we get is a helium nucleus and one leftover neutron. So we've got two protons and two neutrons here. Now, the important bit is that when this fusion happens, there's a little bit of mass which is left over. That's the stuff that is useful for nuclear fusion. Now I've been talking as though the nuclei are the only thing that are around, but of course that's not true because to be electrically neutral, each nucleus needs an electron or multiple electrons circling around the outside so that the negative charge on the electrons balances the positive charge on the protons. But in the right conditions, and this definitely happens at very, very high temperatures, the electrons become separated from the rest of the atom and then you've got positively charged parts and the tiny negatively charged electrons and they're all sort of moving around. So it looks a little bit like a gas, except you've got positive and negative charges. And that's the plasma and that's so difficult to control when it's inside a reactor. There was a big announcement here recently. Tokamak Energy said they were the first private business to achieve plasma that was 100 million degrees. Now that sounds like a very, very big number. It definitely is. But why does it actually matter? Temperature is sort of, it has to be around that 100 million mark just to enable the, the fusion reaction to occur. So the, we're talking about positive ion cores mm -hmm. that we're trying to smush together. Right. Um, so this is like the centre of the atom when the electrons have been removed because it's so hot. This is like trying to push two incredibly powerful magnets together. It's going to repel. So we need to get it hot to overcome that repulsion. Obviously, the, the point of all that machinery in there is to look at something inside quite a violent environment. Plasma, it's not a place any humans want to go. So how do you find out what's going on in there? So this is hotter than the centre of the sun. So we have to be quite clever about how we take measurements. We can't put things inside the plasma. So we have to look at the electromagnetic radiation that's emitted by the plasma. And it's, it's a very noisy environment for us. So when I say that, what I mean is there's a lot of background radiation, uh, electromagnetic radiation, electromagnetic light that comes from the plasma. And we have to pick out very small specific signals. So it's like listening for a pin dropping when you're standing next to a brass band. We that sounds have to <laughs> We have to design our instruments really carefully to look at the right place and get the right signal. We're outside a room that's got big laser signs, so I assume yes. there are lasers involved in this Indeed, somewhere. Indeed, yes. So if you want to measure temperature at different places within the, the plasma, this is how you do it with lasers? This is how we do it, yeah. So in this case, the laser that's housed in this lab, um, it pulses 100 times a second and it produces in each pulse 100 megawatts. Mm -hmm. So that's like 100 million light bulbs going off in a fraction of a second. So it's a lot of energy in it's a very, a lot very of energy. short period of time. Yeah. It has been said many times that fusion is always 30 years away. What's your opinion on whether that's true or not? You know, there are different approaches around the world. There's different startups all around, you know, sort of multiple continents. Um, but what's important is that through that, we're building up the critical mass of researchers that have the knowledge and expertise to make this happen. Um, so, you know, here at Tokamak Energy, we really believe the spherical Tokamak is the route to building a fusion reactor that can make more energy than it uses and supply energy to the grid. Fusion is the most naturally occurring form of energy creation in the universe. 
it's not only just about that temperature that's been achieved, it's all the work around that in terms of the plasma confinement, optimization, all the systems working together in an integrated fashion. That's going to provide the foundation for our next generation device and beyond. A large part of this challenge is having magnets that are good enough and strong enough to make the whole thing work. And this is where all of that happens, the Magnet Laboratory. In order to make a tokamak work, you need a lot of very hot plasma. Yeah. And that sounds like the kind of stuff that doesn't want to stay where it's put. Mm, yeah, yeah, <laughs> So absolutely. how do you keep it where it's put? <laughs> yeah, plasma is a bit like a wriggly snake trying to get out of our cage. So, so we, we keep it where it is by use of magnetic fields. So that's the whole game is we, we build a special cage, a magnetic cage that we, we can use to confine the plasma. So we keep it where it is uh, and actually to shape it as well. So it has to be shaped into just the right form that it gives the optimal plasma parameters for, for fusion. This must require very, very strong magnets. How do you make magnets that are strong enough to confine something like that? That is a material called a superconductor. Specifically, the type we use are called high temperature superconductors. So superconductors are materials that when cooled to cryogenic temperatures, so keep in mind you're 100 million in, in the plasma, we've got to cool our magnet, magnets down to about minus 250 degrees Celsius in order to utilize this property of superconductivity. If you cool it down enough, mm -hmm. it then becomes an electromagnet that doesn't have resistance. Correct. In the magnets we make, they've got joints in them, they're connected to a power supply, and so we're constantly driving the current but the amount of dissipation is truly tiny. It's tiny enough that it's basically zero resistance. So this is um, a bulk piece of the material that makes all of this possible. But what I'm gonna show is that when you cool this down to liquid nitrogen temperature, which is about minus 196 degrees Celsius, this starts to superconduct and it will start to levitate this magnet. So now what we can do is we can actually remove this and the magnet will stay stuck in place. So actually liquid nitrogen is a useful tool for just getting the material to superconduct to some extent to do basic so demonstrations. We can do real coil tests to, to prove that the coil is working, but actually to get the full performance out of the material, you still need to go colder. So what I showed you was a sample of, of bulk rare earth barium copper oxide. And that's, that's, the, that's the magic material, the high temperature superconductor that we use at Tokamak Energy to form our magnets. And this is the material that's present in a sort of one to two micron thick layer that's on a metal tape that we, we then wind around. So what the way the, the sweet point for operating HTS magnets is, is around 20 to 30 Kelvin. Which is just 20 to 30 degrees above absolute zero, yeah. the coldest anything can be in the universe. So, so absolute zero is minus 273 degrees Celsius. So we operate at just 20 above that, minus 253. Everything gets easier that, uh, at those temperatures. When it comes to making these magnets big enough to do this job, yep. robust enough to do it well, are you, are you sure it's achievable? Like, is this, is, this, is this just another can of worms that's going to get complicated? Or is this, like, are you fairly certain this is going to work? I will eat my hat if it doesn't get more complicated. <laughs> it always gets more complicated. Something will come and trip you up and make you scratch your head and think, oh, how are we going to overcome this? And so far, the outlook is good. We all know the prize at stake, clean and near limitless energy if you can make it all work. So are these companies actually going to get there? We have the ST40. That's had an extraordinarily positive campaign. We're also taking the advances we've made on our high temperature superconducting magnets, and we're going to combine those two key technologies together for the first time in our STHTS, our spherical tokamak with high temperature superconductor magnets in our inter intermediate device in or around 2026. That in turn will inform the design optimization for our fusion pilot plant which is targeted for the early 2030s and that 
device will be designed to demonstrate the capability to put net energy, electrons, into the grid. It's been great to come here and see what they're doing and it's, there's no doubt that this is impressive but there's also no doubt about the scale of this technical challenge. However, the reward is potentially enormous. This is not going to get us to net zero by 2050 but what it does offer beyond that is a really sustainable, reliable source of energy that's cheap and clean and that could power humanity's future. So the only certain way to fail is not to try and it's so great to see lots of companies interested in this, huge amounts of investment going in and that is the sort of thing that lets you solve big technical challenges. So I've got my fingers crossed for them. This is an engineering problem, you know, good luck isn't going to help them much but I wish them good luck anyway. I really am positive about this. I don't think it's going to be in the next 10 years but if we get there in 30 years instead of 20 years, maybe Fusion is still 30 years away but at least if it definitely happens in 30 years, this still is a game changer and it is still worth doing. If you like what we do, please subscribe on Patreon, look at the website and the podcast and the live events. There is loads going on. Have a look at fullycharged.show and if you have been, Thank you for watching. So if you enjoyed that video, have a look at this one. I think it's really relevant. That is our latest video, just come out. Up here, you can subscribe and up there, you can support us on Patreon. Thank you.